Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. Where Jesus appears to John, the beloved on the Isle of Patmos, and he reveals himself in a way that John had never seen before. And he begins to speak to the seven churches. A lot of people believe the seven churches are the different seven church ages. And a lot of people believe that we are in the last church, the church of the Laodiceans. And one of the signs of the church of the Laodiceans would be that the fact that they would be lukewarm. And we see this today. Matter of fact, remember the ten virgins, they were all asleep. The ten virgins were asleep. And when he comes, five were foolish and five were wise. Because even though the church had fallen asleep or uh, the ten virgins had fallen asleep, five of them had oil in their lamps. They had brought enough oil to get them through uh, uh, and, and to fulfill the will of God. And, and so, you know, right now the church to a great extent is asleep. And, and, uh, and, and matter of fact, the Bible says, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead. God, Christ wants us to wake up spiritually. To, to, to be sober, be vigilant, because we have an adversary, the devil. And we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. And there is an enemy, a thief, who's coming to steal, kill, and destroy. And the first thing he wants to do is he wants to destroy your relationship with God. See, if he can, if, if he can get you to, to, to uh, not walk with Christ or to let Christ become a part of every part of your existence because we discovered this morning he was speaking to the church of Laodiceans. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. And he that overcometh shall sit with me on my Father's throne. Now, we cannot overcome without inviting Christ into every area of our life because he is the victor. He is the conqueror. He is the overcomer. He says, Be a good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So I need Christ in me to overcome. You know, if you say, Pastor Mike, I just can't overcome. Well, the problem of the fact is you must not be inviting Jesus to help you overcome because he will give you the victory over the devil, the world, and the flesh. He'll give me victory, but here's the honest truth of it. A lot of times we lock Jesus out of certain areas of our life. We say, now, Jesus, you can bless me in my finances, but don't tell me what to watch. You can bless me in my physical body, but tell me how to think or don't tell me how to talk but he wants to have a part of our life from top to bottom inside and out and he and he's not going to bust down the door of your life he's waiting for you to invite him in into your relationships into your thoughts into your actions and your deeds and you know why he wants to come in because he wants to give you life say give you life go ahead point your finger at your neighbor and say give you life he wants to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. Now, the devil, the devil, he don't want you to have life. He'll lie to you. See, he came to the woman, made, made a ridiculous promise to him, and, and, and said, you won't die if you eat of this tree because the devil's a liar. See, the devil's always going to lie to you. And everything the devil tells you that's contrary to the book is just a, a stink of lie from the pit of hell. It really is. And we need to wake up and stop listening to the devil. I don't, I don't want to hear what the devil has to say to me or about me or for me. I want to hear what the shepherd has to say. Amen. See, God has a wonderful plan for each one of us. And the devil has a terrible plan for each one of us. And we're going to have to decide whose voice are we going to listen to. Are we going to listen to the voice of the world, the flesh of the devil, or are we going to listen to Jesus? And if we listen to Jesus, you can't listen to your body because your body, your emotions, your feelings are not going to lead you in the right way. Your feelings are going to lead you astray. And that's why the Bible says the just shall live by faith. faith, not by feelings. And faith says, Lord, let your word be true and let every man be a liar. What you said is true and I'm true. And here's one thing you need to understand is that when you learn to live by faith, faith will always go contrary to your flesh. When you are walking by faith, you will be experiencing pain. You will experience pain. When you walk by faith, it's just like when somebody begins to physically work out, sit-ups, chin-ups, you know, push-ups. It, it's, you know, when your fle flesh hasn't been disciplined and it's out of shape. And, and, and you do, you know, I know one day I did about 10, 10 chin-ups. I walked around for about three days and my arm hurt so bad. I had it done, you know, plus I'm not used to lifting, you know, that 
amount of weight. When I used to do chin-ups, I used to be able to do 50 chin-ups at a time, you know. And But the thing is, is I put a little bit of extra weight on since then. And I did chin, 10 chin-ups. It took everything. Oh, oh. And when I got done, my arms felt frozen, and it hurt so bad. Now, I could have rebuked the devil, but the reality of the fact is my arms were out of shape, and they still are. But you know, no pain, no gain. When you walk by faith, God is always going to lead you in a direction your flesh don't want to go. See, that's why he said, when I come back with the meaning faith left on the earth, the reason why most churches don't have Sunday nights anymore is because it goes against the flesh of the people who go there, and it just, it, it calls, it, it, it just, oh, I just, you know, I just want to go to bed early tonight. Well, I just want to do this. Or I just want. Now, if people were really staying home and praying and fasting and reading their Bible, that'd be wonderful. But remember, the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness. The, the, Moses led the children of Israel into the, the wilderness. See, that's what God's doing. God's going to take you contrary to where your flesh wants to go. Now, you know, you can get so in tune with God, though, your flesh might even leap at doing the will of God. Have you ever been there when your flesh was in harmony and unity with the will of God? But how many of you can honestly say tonight, your flesh didn't want to come here? Let me see your hands. Your flesh did not want to come here. Now, you may not know it, but your flesh did not want to come here. But you came here by faith. You know, also giving financially. You know what? When you really are giving by faith, you give to it hurts. Because your flesh is crying out. Your checkbook is crying out. The bills are crying out. Don't use me for God. But I discovered something. That if you rob from God, that literally the windows of heaven are, are barred up against you. You've got to open the door for God to move in your behalf. And you've got to do it by faith. You've got to live to learn. You've got to learn to live and walk and move and think by faith. So he's visiting the church. That's what it says here. He's coming to the church and he's speaking to the church. And Jesus said something amazing to the church in chapter 2, verse 2. Listen, and, and you got to take a hold of this in your heart. You got to see the reality. What is it that God saved me for? Why did God save me? Well, he saved me that I might become one of his children. He saved me that I might, I, I might go to heaven. He saved me that he could heal me. He saved me that he could bless me. Now, these are things are all true. But really, Christ saved you. The Father saved you. The Son saved you. The Holy Ghost saved you to make you partners together with them. God and children incorporated. And right now, see, this side of heaven is the harvest field. It's not the playground. It's not what we call six flags. This is not a romper room. This is the harvest field. Amen. When you go to heaven, there is no more work. Think about this. When you get to heaven, there is no more work. Pastor Mike, what are we going to do forever in heaven? Have fun. Yes, we are. I know we can't understand this. God made you to have fun forever. You'll never, listen, well, that sounds so boring. That's because you haven't been there yet. I said, you know, people have died and gone to heaven. Matter of fact, Smith Wigglesworth, his wife died, Polly. She died. He raised her back from the dead. It's an amazing story. When she, he raised her from the dead, she was up and said, Smitty, because that's what she called Smith. Smitty, why did you raise me from the dead? Well, honey, I missed you. She, she said, no, no, no. My time on earth is done. So she said goodbye to her husband, and she was gone. She went back to heaven. Because once you get to heaven, you can, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither enter the heart of man those things which God has prepared for them that love him. There's a lot of people who mock heaven. That's because they've never been there. Man, you get to heaven, I'm telling you what, man, you won't want to come back to this earth. But this side of heaven is harvest field. Now's the time to work. Now, in the midst of working, there is fun. You can have fun working together for Jesus, hand in hand, together, out in the harvest field. I used to work with a farmer, and I'd go out there with his sons and with my older brother, and we would bale hay. And let me tell you something. It was hot. It was sweaty. It was nasty. But you know what? There was pleasure in it. There was joy in it. We'd sit down together. We'd go out early in the morning, and I'd be shoveling the manure out of the, out, out, out of the cow stalls, the, the milk cows. And then the, the farmer's wife, she'd be frying up some eggplant. 
and, and, and she'd have some sausage and some, some, uh, some eggs. And I mean, we'd go over there and we'd sit around the table, take off our manure-filled boots at the door, and we'd go and we'd have a hearty breakfast, and then we'd go out and bale some hay. And by the end of the day, we were really tired, but there was, there was joy in the midst of having each other working together. But this is, this is the time to work. I believe that's why the message of work is being so attacked. People, preachers are attacking working for God as if we're preaching a salvation by works. But we're not talking about getting saved by working. We're saying now that you are saved, it's time to work. You know, our society has lost, you know, America was known as being one of the most industrial nations of the world. We were known for what we could produce and what we could make and what we could accomplish until we lost our work ethic. The church were workers. In the book of Acts, they were workers for Christ. As a matter of fact, the Bible says we're saved by grace through faith. Not of ourselves is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. So we're not talking about a works we boast about. The next scripture says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. I'm created for good works. What good works? The works that Jesus did. Now, I believe Jesus did the works that I do, shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do. So I believe in casting out devils, healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, raising the dead. Freely you have, freely give. Now, I believe in these supernatural works, but I also believe in natural physical works. It could also be feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting people in prison. You're there for people when they're sick. So, but also, there's other works. We know there's works of the flesh. It says, now the works of the flesh are manifested in Galatians chapter 5, and there's 18 of them. And they that do such things shall not inherit eternal life. Now, Jesus came to destroy the works of the flesh in Mike Yeager. He came, and, and matter of fact, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but it's Christ that lives within me. The part that he crucified was the works of the flesh, adultery fornication, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, wrath, goes on. See, so these are the works that need to be crucified, but then there's works that God wants to resurrect in me. And Jesus says, the works that I do, shall you do. He said, I must be about my father's business when he was 12 years old. He said, my father, well, he works hitherto, and I also work. So God wants us to be like Jesus. How many know that? How many know Jesus was a hard worker? I need to work for God. And there's profit in all labor. As a matter of fact, notice what Jesus says to his church in verse, chapter 2, verse 2. I know thy works. This is what Jesus said. I know thy works. For in other words, God is looking at the works or what you're doing with your life. And this is Revelation 2, verse 2. I know thy works and thy labor. I know thy works and thy endurance or patience. How thou canst not bear them which are evil. So he goes on and he begins to exhort the church that's in Ephesus. He says, I know thy works. In verse 5, he begins to tell them that they're beginning to mess up a little bit because they're slacking off. They're not working for them like they should. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, repent, and do the first works. You know, a lot of people, when they first get born again, man, you know, when they really get on fire for God, at least I did, I was a worker. I, 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 cannot, re I cannot relate with people who don't work for God. Now, I'm not talking about full-time ministry. I'm talking about whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord, not unto man, knowing that you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. And I could give you example after example how God blesses people who roll up their sleeves for him, and they're not doing it for men. They're doing it for Christ. See, if you're doing stuff for Pastor Mike, you're going to be extremely disappointed. And if you're a Jaegerite, you're a sick puppy. Don't ever become a Jaegerite. I mean, we got Haganites and, 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 and Copelandites and, 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 and Benites. No, I want to be a Jesusite. If you ever put me up on a pedestal, you've got a major problem because I'm going to fall off your pedestal. 
because I'm a flesh and blood man just like you all are. Amen? I've got problems. I've got weaknesses. That's why we need each other. None of us are an island unto ourselves. Simon Garfunkel was full of Funkel. He, he, I am a rock, I am an island. Well, they can be a rock and an island, but I've got one rock I build my life on, and his name is Jesus Christ. <laughs> Amen? And so we need to understand that God saved you to not sit on the premises, not to be in churches with high steeple and dry people, but to work for him. Because the night comes when no man can work. And when I get to heaven... I'm not going to regret how much I worked for God. I'm going to regret for the fact that I didn't do more for God. I, I want to see, I, man, I've been saved since 1975. Traveled around the world. God's allowed me to have the privilege to start over 25 churches and to help start churches. I just got back from South America. God is opening up Japan for us and, and Taiwan for us. As a matter of fact, the lady who works directly with Heidi Baker, she's in, 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 in she's leaving, she's already gone in Taiwan, and she's translating our, our, my, the book, Horrors of Hell, Splendors of Heaven, into Chinese, and a Japanese company, a printing company, contacted me, and they are printing my book, Horrors of Hell, Splendors of Heaven, and they're paying me a royalty. They sent me a check already for that book. But I'm not yet happy. I want to touch more people's lives. Now, all of us are called to do different things. One person's given a pound, another one's a three pounds, another one's five pounds. And so don't compare yourself to one another. God's not called everybody to do what I'm doing, and God's not called me to do what you're doing. But we're all called to work. Say, I'm called to work. We're all called to do whatever God calls us to do. If God hasn't given you a load of responsibility, you ought to jump up and kick your feet together and say, praise God, I'm not Pastor Mike. Hello? I mean, some of these men out here, they're doing awesome works, you know, like Franklin Graham. But I'm not Franklin Graham. Thank God I'm not Franklin Graham. I just need to be who God made me to be. But he says to the church in Ephesus, I know thy work. He says, you've fallen from what you used to do. In the beginning, you worked for me. What happened? Something happened. The cares of life, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things. Fears. Stuff. Stuff. Well, Pastor Mike, we'd get involved, but you know, we got things to do. There's only one problem. He bought you with his blood. You See, we got to get this. You do not belong to yourself. You belong to Jesus. And if you forget that, you won't be working for Jesus. So I, my wife and I, we got out of Bible school, and I went to work for a little company in Mount Union, uh, Pennsylvania. It was called Bear, uh, B-E-Y-E-R, and they made Easter grass. I got in there, and most places, you know what? It's hard to find good workers. I hear this all the time. But I was a young man. I think I was about 25 or 26. I rolled up my sleeves, and I mean, I just went to work. And, and while they're all standing around, and, and I wasn't trying to get a position. Next thing I know, I'm caught into the man's office whose factory it is. He's a Jewish man. And I was only there for three months, and he put me, the guy who was running their shipping and receiving, I didn't know nothing about this stuff, loading and unloading train cars. Before you know it, he put me over all of the shipping and receiving department. Why did he put me over the shipping and receiving department? Because he saw my work ethic. But what he didn't know, and I preached to him too when I went into I said, I'm not doing this for you, sir. He, I said, I'm doing it for Jesus. Because the Bible says, whatever you do, do it as heartily as unto the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap. You know why Joseph was promoted so quick in Potiphar when, when, when he was taken as a slave? Because he kept his heart right, even though he was wrongly done, and even though he was a slave, he gave his best for God. And then even when he was lied about from Potiphar's wife and accused of trying to molest her and rape her, he didn't get an attitude and just say, well, I'm just going to sit here and stew in this prison. God must not love me. He didn't get an attitude towards God. He didn't get an attitude towards Potiphar. He didn't get bitter. He got better. Don't get bitter, get better, get sweeter. And you know what he did? He was running to prison before he left. And next thing you know, God promoted him. Say, my day of promotion, day of promotion is, coming. is coming. Amen. If you will do what's right, if you'll just do it for Jesus, get that in your mind. Do it for, I've been pastoring for almost, almost 34 years. You know, this church has not paid me since about 1999. You know why? I don't grumble and gripe because I'm not doing it for the organization. I'm doing it for Jesus. No, I'm doing it for Jesus. I'm not doing it for what I can. You know, a lot of pastors, if they stop getting a paycheck, they're going to pack up their suitcase and go somewhere else. 
But I'm not doing it for that reason. And you need to have the same attitude. You need to do it for Jesus. Tell somebody, do it for Jesus. Now you say, well, somebody might take advantage of me. Well, not if you're doing it for Jesus. And not if you're led by the Holy Ghost. See, you and I got to become sensitive because the devil will send people to you in the guise of love and want to strip you of your money and do nothing. And yet the Bible tells us, listen, the Bible says, if a man doesn't work, he should not eat. Oh, Pastor Mike, do you believe that's physical? Yes, I believe it's spiritual and physical because even Paul said when I came to you, he said, I did not ask for any help. He said, I worked with my own hands. He said, why? Because he wanted to be a good example. Say, I want to be a good example. Now, when, when I preach and teach, I'm not thinking of anybody in particular. I'm just preaching what the Word says. Because a lot of times when I'm preaching, I'm kicking myself in my rear end and you just don't see it. I mean, I'm speaking to Mike Yeager because you know what? I'm not like some of you. I haven't arrived yet. Or I shouldn't say some of you, those down the street at the other church. <laughs> but I want you to see, I know thy works. Jump down there in verse 9. And he's talking to another church. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. What? I know thy works. Isn't it amazing? Jesus says, I know thy works. I know. Yeah, but Pastor Mike, I thought by their fruits you'll know them. Well, Jesus is saying, I know you by your works. You know, part of the work of God, you know, part of the work of God is doing whatever the Bible says. Loving your wives, submitting to your husbands, tithing, praying, lifting your hands, that's spiritual works. Casting out devils, healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, praying, that's work. Let me tell you something. If you don't think it takes work to pray, just go ahead and pray for an hour, two hours, or three hours a day and see if that doesn't take work. You've got to shut your mind up. I carry a little book with me, and I don't have it with me tonight, and I just, th things would come to my mind, and I just start jotting them down. Now, spiritual things, but I also get the natural things out of my way. See, I'm a visionary. And what I mean by that, God, God gives me tremendous ideals, and I just begin to write them down, and I begin to, get to, I begin to call them into existence. Yeah. I begin to call those things which be not as though they were. And it's not just me, it's the body that God... See, God is going to send people that are going to walk with us together. And I'm not here to be exalted. I'm here to help wash your feet with the water of the word and by example. I can only take you where I've been, amen? I can't take you where I'm not. If I'm not committed, if I'm not sold out, if I don't love God, if I'm not doing the will of God, I can't take you into that place. But how many of you want to go into that place? How many of you want to fulfill the will of God for your life? See, the devil tells you that you can't because he knows you can. If you could not do the will of God, he would not even tell you. He'd let you find out for yourself. But you can't. See, God, you got to get this in your heart. God has a purpose for your life. And you're not here tonight by accident. Tell somebody, I'm not here by accident. So I know thy works. Look there in verse 13. And he says to the church of Pegamus, I know thy works. I mean, Jesus is saying this, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning, I know thy works in verse 19. I know thy works. And this is the church in uh, Tarithia. He says, I know thy works in charity and service and faith and thy patience and, I, and thy works. I know thy works. So Christ is looking at what you're doing with your hands. I remember there used to be a, a palm reader across the street. And, and I don't know why I like to always kind of challenge these people. One day they had a bunch of cars over there. So I walked over there. You know that we had just put up our facility here. I walked over there and I walked into it. And they had a bunch of people sitting around waiting for the palm reader to read her, their palms. And I said, listen, I can save you all a bunch of money. They said, what? I said, I'm the local pastor right across the street. And I said, God has given me a spiritual gift, and I can read the palms of your hands and tell you what your future is. They looked at me with great big old eyes. They said, you can? I said, yeah, and I won't even charge you. They, they, and, and they're just kind of waiting, suspended, like, what am I going to say? I said, I can tell you your future by what you're doing with your hands. Whoa. 
I can tell you your future by what you're doing with your hands. Are you using your hands to glorify God? Are you using your hands for the plow? Are you using your hands to lay them on the sick? Are you using your hands to cast out devils? I can tell you your future. You don't have to spend all that money. What you do with your hands reveals where you're headed. These hands are supposed to be, it says lifting holy hands. These hands are instruments. These hands are tools. These hands are made for the will of God. Amen? Go, you can use these hands to clap and praise the Lord. Amen. You can use these hands either to point a critical finger and find fault, or you can reach out your hand and help somebody out of their ditch. <laughs> have some, sister. You can lay hands on people and get them drunk in the Holy Ghost. Did you know that? Did you know that, sister? <laughs> See, some people are more susceptible. See, there's, there's, there's an anointing. <laughs> there's an anointing in the hands. Amen. And the Bible says, he that hath clean hands will be stronger and stronger. Amen. Go ahead and praise the Lord with your hands. Go ahead. <laughs> I might have to stop now. <laughs> Look there in verse 23. At the very end of verse, in the very end of verse 23, he says, I will give unto every one of you, I will give unto every one of you, say everyone. Everybody shout everyone. <laughs> I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Say, you know, you, you, when you get to heaven, this is, this is honest to God truth. When you get to heaven, what's going to happen here is he is going to give you. A, see, you don't know what she's going through till you get some. When it begins to sneak up on you, hey, don't resist it. Say, Pastor, I don't know if it's polite to be laughing. It is. Just do it. It's wonderful. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I, I, wish, I, I, I wish you all were drunk in the Holy Ghost. I wish you all were happy in Jesus. Amen. <laughs> just have some more joy. Amen. Hi, sister. God bless you. You came in just at the right time. <laughs> but, you know, he says, I'm going to give each one of you according to your works. You know, Jesus, he gives the parable about the man who gives out a pound and he gives out two, three, two pounds and three pounds. And then the day is going to come and he's going to call them. He's going to say to them. He, and he said this, occupy till I return. The word occupy means to work. Say, I am called. To be a worker in the harvest field. God's called you to work. He's equipped you to work. This is a true story. One time I was leaving a church and I was in kind of a, a, a two or three month period when my wife and I was going to head off to Germany by faith. Just landed there with Michael. He was just three months old. Just landed in Frankfurt, Germany, not having nowhere to go. Just God said, go. This happens to me all the time. God spoke to me and said, go down to shore. And I'm a little country in Brazil. I, I, and, and God opened up the whole nation to me this last spring. So when God just says to me sometimes, go, I just go. And I don't even know what's going to happen. I just know that God is going to lead in God. Some of you came to Gettysburg, and you don't even know what you're doing here. So what am I doing in Gettysburg? Brother Wayne came all the way up from Florida. What am I doing here in this area? Uh, uh, Brother Darrell and his family came all the way from Maryland. What am I doing up here? Amen. Uh, Sister Ka Katharina. Katharina, she came all the way up to Gettysburg. She don't even know what she's doing here. I know what she's doing here. God has an assignment for her. Amen. I came to Gettysburg. I hate Gettysburg. I said, Lord, what am I doing? You know, you know you got to be in the will of God when you're somewhere that you hate. Amen. See, because faith always takes you to the place where your flesh don't want to go. Man, I'd rather be ministering. You know, some of these guys, they're pastoring the Bahamas. Let me tell you something. God didn't take them to the Bahamas. <laughs> I know somebody's got to go to the Bahamas, but the flesh took them there. I think there's a lot of pastors in a lot of churches where God didn't take them, but they took them because it was easy going. You know, but some of us are troublemakers. You know what I mean by that? Some of us are, are we, 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 go, we like to go where there's lots of trouble because only God can get us out of the mess we get ourselves into. And so he says, I know thy works. You will be rewarded according to thy works. He said, Pastor Mike, what if I, you know, there's a lot of spiritual lazy people today. 
See, we, because, you know, in, in, in our society right now, we're being embarred, and, and I'm just not going to get political, but we have been being flooded with this welfare mentality where we think the government owes us something. And here is the danger. A lot of people have become dependent upon the government, and what they don't understand is the government's going to become your God. And the day will come when the government will tell you things you cannot do and you can do for God, and you're going to have to decide who is your God. And so we, we, we have come, see, because you understand the Antichrist spirit is a one-world government order that wants to basically control, it wants to be God. See, that's the devil. He wants to be God. Well, I tell you right now, the devil ain't going to be my God. Amen. So I weaned, listen, I literally weaned myself off of the government a long time ago. Now, I'm not telling you that the government sends you a check, you shouldn't cash it, and you shouldn't tithe on it, because you should. <laughs> but I'm telling you, get yourself ready. See, I've, I've been preparing my heart for years and years and years, because the day will come where it's more dangerous for you to use the medical world than it is for you to believe Jesus. As a matter of fact, you may not know it, it's already happened. The, 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 second number, the second number one killer in America, for other words, or it's the third killer in America, is prescribed drugs from the medical world. Did you know that? They're the third, the third number one killer. For other words, not the first killer. I think the first killer is alcohol, uh, uh, drunk driving, but, uh, and, and then cancer. But medical, the, the medical world. As a matter of fact, up in New York somewhere, a town, the doctors and all the medical industry went on strike. And they discovered something. After one month, they discovered in the obituaries that the death rate dropped to about half of what it was before. Well, how is that? Because you know what? It's like the little woman with the issue of blood. She spent all that she had, and she was rather worse. Amen. So I've just, I, I've been learning since I've been saved 1975. And I'm not telling you to throw away your medicine and don't go to doctors because you're going to live where you're at. But I want to help you to get out of where you're at and to where you need to go. I, I'd like to help you to how, how to believe God. And if you think healing comes because there is no pain in your body, that's a lie. Because most times when I believed God to heal me, my body was so full of pain I couldn't hardly stand it. But in the midst of standing on the word, because I did not think I was healed, I did not believe I was healed, I knew I was healed. And God healed me of a broken foot, a busted kneecap, and a broken back. And he also healed me of tumors in my body. And I had all the signs of colon cancer once and prostate cancer. And God healed me every single time. I had a hernia one time, and it took a number of years, but one morning I got up and the hernia was gone, and it's never come back. But I'm telling you what, it was a walk of faith. And it wasn't somebody telling me to trust God. I'm not telling you, well, throw away your medicine. That's insanity. But don't, 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 don't let the devil condemn you about where you're at, but you need to get ready to where you need to be. Because the day will come where it will be more dangerous to go to the world than it would be to go to Jesus. Tell somebody he's talking to me. And so he says, I know thy works. Uh, look what it says here in verse 19. I know thy works in charity and service of faith. We read that. Uh, in verse 23, I give unto every man according to the works. In verse 26, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. For it was people who roll up their sleeves, spiritually speaking. He said, I'm going to give them power over the nations. Look there in chapter 3, in verse 3. Uh, actually, in verse 1, he's talking to the church of Sardis. And he says this, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest in our debt. For in other words, he says, I, I, know, I know what's going on in your life. God says, I know your works. A lot of these churches had problems. How I many you know churches are like people? Amen. I mean, the church cannot be any more spiritual than the people who come to it. And really, if you study this, he wrote it to the seven angels. And another translation says the messengers, or he literally wrote this to the apostles of these churches. And he says, and he's actually writing to the pastors. See, the pastors are in big trouble. I'm not picking on them, but pastors were in big trouble. Because it says, be not many masters, knowing that you shall receive the greater condemnation. 
Let me tell you something. I knew that I knew that I knew the minute I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, I was called to preach the gospel. I didn't even know what a preacher was. I knew what a priest was. I knew what a, I knew what a, a, a nun was. I knew what a bishop was and a pope was, but I didn't know what a preacher was. My Catholic preach, pre, uh, 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 priest did not preach. He, he just spoke in Latin. I don't know to this day what he said. But I knew I was called to preach. And I knew, I didn't know I was called, I didn't know it was called the fivefold ministry, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. But I knew. And Paul said, Woe be unto me if I preach not the gospel. Then there's some people, they could take it or leave it. I can't leave it. I've got to preach. Because I know I'm going to stand before God and give an account of my life. And he's going to say, what did you do with the gifts I gave you? I know he gave me the ability to preach because I couldn't even say my own name until he healed me of my speech impediment. I quit school at 15 years old. I knew it was God that's given me the ability to memorize and to meditate upon the scriptures. I know it was God that put his word in my mouth. I knew it was God who sent me to the nations. But I'm going to give an account. And it says, be not many masters, knowing that you shall receive the greater condemnation. So really it begins with leadership. If the pastor isn't going out for all the way for God. It's going to be very, I know people have this theology, and I'm not saying God never sends people into a church to where they can try to help bring about a change, but let me tell you something. You are not going to, that church can go no further spiritually than what the pastor is, if the, if, and, unless you go somewhere else and you get it. You understand? You might be able to go somewhere else and get something more, but I'm telling you right now, pastors, he's writing to the pastors, and he's telling the pastors, I know thy works. See, I, I believe on the back, and let me just encourage you, on the back wall of our sanctuary, we, and, and actually I'm getting a banner made up, it's going to be called the wall. That's going to be called the wall. And on the back wall, we've got, we, and matter of fact, there's seven more departments I need to put up there. There's going to be almost 60 departments. And the Lord spoke to me years ago. He said, son, don't try to mold and shape people into a position where my spirit has not gifted them. He said, give people an opportunity because your physical body has eyes, it has ears, it has nose, it has a mouth. Well, you know what? You're just a part of the body. And so what we do in a local church, we have like three or four departments. We got the prayer department, the worship department, the children's department, and things like this, the visitation department. But you know what? There's, there, there, you might not be gifted to move in those areas. Some of you might be gifted to do missionary work. Some of you might be gifted to help the orphans or the widows. Some of you might be gifted. And, I, and, we got, and the Lord spoke to me. He said, son, he said, I want you to give an opportunity for my people to find out where they belong and to find their place in the body. You have a place in the body. And we're going to close in Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, please. I mean, you, you've got a job to do. You may not know what your job is yet. Well, Pastor Mike, why doesn't God tell me what I, I'm, I'm called to do? I'll tell you why he won't do. Because you've got to first be faithful over the little bit he's given you. If you'll be faithful with what he's given you, he'll give you more. But if you can't even be faithful over the little stuff, you know, it's like, you know what they discovered? You know, a lot of people a lot of times think their problem is lack of money. It's not. They have, and over and over, people who've won the lottery, they found out that they were, they, they, they got, matter of fact, I know the prince, they're related to a guy who won the lottery. He's more broke now than he was before he won the lottery, and he lost his wife and his whole family. Because if you're not faithful over a dollar, let me tell you something. If you won't tithe on a dollar, you won't tithe on a million. If you won't be faithful over a dollar, God knows. Well, God, if you'll just give me a million dollars, God, I'll use it for your glory. No, you won't. Because you didn't even have enough faith to give on a dollar, let alone giving on a million See, that's why I believe, I literally believe, and I've already, you know, millions have already flowed through my hands. So let me tell you, I've not always been a good steward. I've done some stupid stuff. What are they, Pastor? None of your business. <laughs> the Bible says a wicked man digs up the sins of another. I tell you what, man, there's dead bones in the back of all of our yards, and I'm not coming into your yard to dig them up. That's between you and Jesus. You understand? I ain't got nothing to hide, but God knows all of our hearts. And the minute you get around, somebody begins to ask you what your past was, except for a testimony, you just walk away from them. 
when they begin to ask you and begin to probe in your life and begin to dig in your life because a wicked person digs into the life of another. I don't go digging in nobody's. As a matter of fact, sometimes people want to share with me what they've done in their life. I say, whoa, no, brother. The Bible doesn't say confess your sins. He says confess your thoughts. So let me tell you something. You got some things you're struggling with? Don't give me the details. You, God knows the details. I'm not God. Say, thank you, Jesus, that Pastor Mike's not God. <laughs> Because if I was, you all be in trouble. <laughs> I'd be in trouble. I'm not God. I don't want to go digging in nobody's backyard. I don't want to go digging in your life. And nobody else has the right to dig in your life. I've had people try to dig in my life. I said, well, why do you want to know? Well, where'd you come from? What did you do? What happened? How come this? How come that? None of your business. Tell your neighbor, none of your business. See, just love one another. Now, if something needs to be dealt with, God will show us. But a lot of times, you know, God will show me things going on in people's lives. But, and sometimes he even gives me a vision and shows me what they've done or where they've been or where they just came from. And you know what? I keep it to myself. I don't even share it with my family most times because God showed me it where I could protect the local body or I could stand in the gap and believe him for restoration. <laughs> you know how many know that as long as you're still breathing, there's hope for you. Tell someone there's hope for you. <laughs> Say there's hope for me. Amen. Is that good preaching? I mean, that's just meat and potatoes, ain't it? You know? I mean, we got too much cotton candy going on in the church. Too many lollipops. You know, too many sugar kings. Except during the time of Christmas, you can have some then. But I want you to notice what it says in Ephesians now, in Ephesians chapter 4. And, you know, Paul has said an amazing thing in chapter 3. He said that we might be rooted and grounded in love, that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, that we might know the love of Christ, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Can you imagine me filled? That means to be full of God from head to toe. Just permeate with God. I mean, you can smell the fragrance of the lily of the valley or the rose of Sharon. You can smell God coming off out of the pores of a person. I mean, you know, you can get to such a place spiritually to where you can literally walk in the place and devils will begin to scream and come out of people. I've done it. I've seen it. I've seen it. You can ask my son. We went down to, to Suriname, and I'm walking into the midst of a crowd or walking into the midst of the service, and demons just began to be manifested and began to go into what looked like epileptic seizures, and we just began to cast the devils out. And when I cast the devil out, I don't take no hour. I just tell them to come out in the name of Jesus. And I turned my back on them. See, they didn't know better. Down in Suriname, there was a woman that had a devil being cast out, and this devil manifested, and, and, and they went down, and, and I put my hands, and I said, in the name of Jesus, you foul devil, come out of her. Now, I knew the minute I told the devil to come out, it had to come out. It ain't got no choice. But the people who didn't know better, they kept on praying, trying to get it to come out. And I finally said, listen, listen, let's just back away, back away. And when they backed away, and she just gave a sigh of relief, and a smile came on her face. You know why? Because the devil, he's, he's just buffling you. Every time Jesus cast the devil out of a person, they would fall down and go into a fit, and he'd walk away. Because he told the devil to come out. Every knee shall bow and every tongue. People say, I'm just going to keep praying until I feel like I'm saved. No, you don't pray in order to believe that you're saved. You know you're saved and so you pray. You got to get the cart behind the horse. We get the cart before the horse. We, see, we, we get to thinking, man, if I just pray enough, then God will move. No, because you believe God moves. See, you pray in faith. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. See, prayer, supplication with thanksgiving. But anyways, we're in Ephesians chapter 4, aren't we? <laughs> All right, look what it says in Ephesians chapter 4. When he has sent it upon high, look there. In Ephesians 4, let's begin here in verse 8. Wherefore he says, when he ascended it upon high, he let captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also who ascended afar above all heaven, all things, and he gave, he gave some apostles, say some, some. and some prophets, some. and some evangelists, some. and some pastors, some. and teachers. And, and let, me just, let me just quote this. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Let, let me just, and I'm not attacking men here because they're going to stand before God. 
But let me tell you something. The Bible says, let every man abide in the calling where he was called. He gave some pastors. In this little Adams County, we got 130 pastors. He gave some pastors. I'm just going to be blunt with you. I'm totally convinced that probably 80% of the pastors in the pulpit are not pastors. They're not called to be pastors. They're not called because you're supposed to bring people to the where. You're supposed to perfect the saints, equip the saints, help the saints fulfill the will of God. And what is that? For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. So a pastor is supposed to help you mature and grow in the things of God. And a pastor is supposed to equip you to work for the kingdom in the harvest field. I literally believe, and I'm not judging their hearts, I literally believe a lot of these men are not preparing people to work in the harvest. All they're doing is they're getting a paycheck and they're entertaining you. Being a good speaker does not make you a pastor. Entertaining people does not make you a pastor. Matter of fact, a true man of God is going to what? Reprove, correct, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. A true pastor or apostles. Matter of fact, you know what? Just to be honest with you, in the New Testament, it talks about prophets over 150 times. It talks about prophets. It talks about apostles 80 times. And it talks about pastors one time. Right here, that's the only time it talks about a pastor. Now, there's shepherds, and there's what we call the chief shepherd and under shepherds. I don't understand this. But why would God send 130 pastors into a little county when he wants his church to be one? You know how many men have split churches and started churches? You can't tell me that's God. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body. Let me ask you something. What kind of movement would we have in this little county if there was only really one church that had many ministers working together? See, that's what I envision. I envision the five-fold ministry. Years ago, the Lord gave this to me. I, matter of fact, way back when we first started here, and I didn't want to start here. I didn't want to have a church here. It's, I knew that I knew. It's just I didn't want to be here. And that's why I knew God sent me here. But I gathered three other ministers together that were preaching along the same line. I got them together. We had one joint church service, and the place was packed out. We had a couple hundred people in that meeting. And I took these guys aside, and I said, listen, brothers, I don't need to be the head pastor. I said, matter of fact, if God wants me to travel, that'd be wonderful. You know, we could share the pulpit. Let's all work together because we're all preaching the resurrected Christ. We all believe in healing. We all believe in the authority. Now, these are men that were like precious faith. All those three men said no to me. And those churches are gone. Oh, they struggled and they survived for a while. You know why they're gone? Because God had it really caught them. I'm not talking about in this area. See, because when you, when, let me tell you something, there's a fight to fight when God calls you to do something. I mean, what I'm talking about, you got to fight to fight by faith. Man, because every devil in hell is going to be there to rip you out. But he said he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. See, I'm really, what I'm here is I'm here to encourage you to work. There, there's, there's, there's great reward in work. You need a, and so what you need to do, this is what I'm going to encourage you as we get ready to close. You need to go to the back wall of this facility. And we got like seven more departments that we need to put up there. And you'll see the ones that God has already filled in the sense of leadership because this is what we're believing for. We're not just putting anybody in these departments. There's got to be a call. I mean, I know Brother Darrell, he's over the prayer ministry. See, and let me tell you something, just talking about uh, Brother Darrell and his wife, uh, Beverly, we're, none of us are perfect, but he is called to pray. He's got a, an anointing like a Father Nash, if you know who Father Nash was. I needed somebody with that anointing. Sister Vi was called to pray. She used to help, head up our prayer time. And we, we pray here now, and I believe it's going to even become greater. And prayer, prayer, 
is, is, is such a solid foundation that we got to have. But we have people who are called to prison ministry. They're called. Now, they're not maybe five-fold ministry. Most of those things up on the, on the back wall, they're not five-fold ministry. They're people in the body who God has given a, 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 an unction, a calling, a motivation, an urging. There's a fire burning in their heart. There's something back there for you. And if there ain't, write it down and come to me. And say to me, Pastor Mike, I know Sister Nancy, she's been telling us for some time, Pastor Mike, we need, we need to have meals more often. We need to have fellowship more often. Yeah. And you know what? Because God put that in her heart. And so what happens in most churches, the pastors, they have, they have you know, they're kind of locked into a certain type of for formality, a certain type of system. This is how our denomination does it. This is how this, let me tell you something. You will not, as far as I know, you will not find another church like this in all of America. I mean, I've been around. Because, see, I'm a visionary. The Lord gave me the 999 plan. You all know. And the 999 plan, nine fruits of the Spirit, nine gifts of the Spirit, and there's nine things that must be strong in our church. And what is it? The Word, the moving of the Spirit, prayer. We, we're going to have an awesome praise and worship team. Awesome praise and worship. And benevolence, helping the poor, helping the widows, helping the orphans. You know, the Lord spoke to me. He said, son, you need to treat all these single mothers because 50% of the children in America now are being raised in single family homes. You need to begin to treat these single mothers and these children like they're widows and orphans. You need to begin, and we are, as God begins to add, we're going to put in the paper, we help single mothers. But we got to have the person who has, who has that, that, that. See, and we don't want you to get in, and we don't want you really to be in four or five departments so you could be involved in different departments. We want somebody in every one of these departments that has a fire for that department. I'm not talking about molding. You know, a lot of times people are going to try to shape you and try to put you into something like a square plague in a round hole. No, we're looking for people whose heart cries out for single mothers or whose hearts cries out for the prisoners or whose heart cries out for, for the young men or young women that don't have a mommy and a daddy. You understand what I'm saying? Somebody's heart who cries out for missionaries. Or somebody's heart who cries out for whatever area there is. You know, and God is, listen, I know the Lord spoke to me. So what do we have? We have benevolence. We have discipleship and we have evangelism, the nine that we need in this church. Every department comes underneath one of those nines. Prayer. It comes the word of God, the spirit of God. Prayer, praise, uh, worship, benevolence, evangelism, discipleship, and family. So the Lord spoke to me. He said, son, you haven't loved my people like you should. You haven't loved them like I love them. So you haven't been there for them like you need to be. Now, it's not a one-man job. It's not a one-horse one carriage. It's all of us loving each other. But how can I help you love people if I don't love people the way I should? I mean, he really got, see, my father, he really whips me, man. <laughs> he takes me out to the woodshed all the time because I want to be whipped. How, how many of you all want to be whipped? <laughs> Come on now. How many, how many, how many don't want to be whipped, but you know you need to be whipped? Let me ask you that. <laughs> You don't want to be whipped, but you need to be whipped. Whew. Woo! I'm telling you right now. I'm telling you by the Holy Ghost. Just look around a little bit. I know we got a small crowd here tonight, but let me tell you something. You, bet, you, bet, you better enjoy this time. Because I'm telling you, as we come into this new year, we are going to have such an outflow. People, man, they're looking to be loved. And that's natural. So, yeah, we're going to help, we're going to love people, but then we're going to teach them how to love. Because it's all right to be loved, but it's so amazing to love. It's all right to receive, but it's more blessed to give. You know, I like to receive, amen? I mean, I needed a financial miracle the other day like you can't believe. And the next thing you know, I opened up my mailbox and there was a check for $300. I said, oh, glory, hallelujah, I needed that $300. And the same day, another $300 came in from somewhere I didn't think it was coming. I said, oh, hallelujah, I needed that $300, you know, to pay the bills of the church, you understand. And that's wonderful, but I love it when I can give. Don't you love it just when you can bless people and not just get blessed? I don't want to just be blessed. I want to be a blessing, amen? But I'll not turn down a blessing. So if God tells you to bless me, I'll receive it. 
Amen. Come on, you'd have to be stupid not to receive a blessing. And I'm not talking about greasing somebody's palms and controlling somebody because you ain't going to buy me. See, you can't buy me. You know what? I've already been bought. He's already bought me with his precious blood. Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. <laughs> Woo! Whew. We're headed into some exciting times. Oh, it's going to be rough and turbulent. The world is going to fall around. I mean, the, fall, the world's falling down. The, the economy is going to fall apart. It is. I'm telling you, it's happening right now. Our whole governmental system's falling apart. A lot of churches are disappearing. You cannot, it's frightening. Like 1,500 pastors a month are dropping out of the ministry. That was a statistic two years ago. 1,500 pastors. Churches are closing everywhere. I was driving down the other day. Somebody, Brother Angel, told me, he said, well, did you see that church for sale there in Fayetteville? I said, there ain't no church for sale in Fayetteville. I'm driving down a the road. There's the sign. It's for sale. Yeah. People can't pay their bills. Yeah, Wayne. Got a question. If they're closing, why can't we get ahead? Why can't we get Because we got to begin to love them. Because we got to get ready for them because they don't know we're here yet. See, God's going to do this. All we got to do is be obedient to what he gives us to do. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, I know <laughs> by the Holy Ghost. Woo! Ha! Lord, that we're here tonight by divine ordination. Lord, that you have amazing things in store for those who love you and obey you. Lord, there's people here tonight, they paid a price to be obedient. Man, they paid a price to be obedient. And there's other people, they don't even know the price they're going to pay to be obedient. <laughs> And, Lord, don't even let them see what they're going to have to go through. <laughs> Just let them experience it for themselves. But, Lord, even tonight, I thank you. Lord, there are those who have already paid the price. And the Lord would have you to know that because you have paid the price, that which you've been believing for, I tell you right now, Brother Darrell, I'll tell you, the, spirit, the prophetic word of the Lord will say, Yea, my son, I've seen the price that you paid. I see the cry of your heart and your wife's heart. I've seen how the devil tried to discourage you and even try to stop you and prevent you from obeying me. Amen. But the time of harvest is upon you. Hallelujah. The time of reaping is about to take place. It's about to come forth speedily, speedily. Even by this spring as the snow begins to melt and the ice begins to disappear, you'll begin to see the fruits, the fruits springing forth. Uh, like, like a garden that's beginning to blossom and bring forth the harvest, there's going to be a wonderful harvest. And not, not just in this place, but even in those places you have left behind, even those places you have walked and prayed and preached, he is going to bring forth a harvest in those places because the word does not return void. And I'm about to do a wonderful thing in your sons and your daughters. I'm about to bring them in. The hook is in their jaw. They do not just know it. And they will become, listen, I'm telling you, they will become, I've sensed this in my heart for some time now, brother and sister, they're going to become your greatest asset. Whew, what you thought was a detriment will be an asset, would say the Lord. And the time will come because they have said, Dad, I just don't understand you. But the time will come when the veil will be pulled away from their eyes and they'll finally say, Dad, I see it, I see it, I see it. I see it. I see it. I see it. Woo! Ha! 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 And the Lord say, you've not come to this area by mistake. Oh, there was a price to pay that no one understands. The hardship, the trouble, the trials. And even those who love you and have tried to mentor you, they have not understood. But you knew in your heart that there was a divine purpose and a mission even in this area. And so rejoice would say the Lord, I'm about to open doors that no man can shut. And I'm about to shut doors that no man can open. And I'm about to take you into a way that you have not yet known. And even all of that which I have invested in you, for you see this has been an investment. God has poured himself into you. And even that which he has invested is about to bring forth wonderful dividends. <laughs> Woo! For the glory of the kingdom. name of Jesus, I pray a hundredfold return in that giving that she just gave 
And Lord, I thank you it's the seed of her blessing in Jesus' name. <laughs> Sister Vi, the Lord say, I have prepared you. I have made you ready. You've gone through many trials and tribulations and tests. And there are times when you seem like you were all alone and no one understood you. You have stood the time and the testing. You have stayed in the furnace when everything around you was being devoured, but I have been with you in the midst of it. And I am about to use you. I'm about to flow. I'm about to speak and declare my mind, my will, and my emotions. I'm about to bring forth revelation knowledge that you will say, I never knew this before, but it will come out of your mouth like a mighty river flowing forth. I have prepared. You have paid the price. It has been hard and it's been difficult, and there's been many times of discouragement, but you have been and you are continuing to plow through all of the problems. For you're like the lady with the issue of blood, for you said, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. And the wholeness that we're talking about is not just a physical healing, but it's a spiritual explosion of the things of heaven. Lord, I thank you for it now. You prepared her for such a time as this. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And Sister Raquel, God has prepared you. Listen, I'm telling you right now that that which you have been faithful with, that little which you have been faithful with, is about ready to be open. Because you've been faithful over the little, God is about to make you rule over much. You will find yourself, listen, I'm telling you right now prophetically, you will find yourself being moved out of the secular world of, in, of employment into the spiritual employment for the church, the body, and the bride. You will find yourself beginning to have so much to do for the kingdom, and I'm not talking about to where the finances won't come in, but I'm talking about a financial income. God is going to open the door, and he will bring you into financial financial income where the finances are coming in and you will be employed by the kingdom to do the work of the king. Because whom God calls, he provides. He provides. He provides. He provides. Hallelujah. <laughs> huh, 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 huh. Freedom is coming, Sister Deb. Woo! Freedom is coming. Freedom is coming. Hang on. Don't let go. Don't be discouraged. Don't turn back. Hang on. Wonderful times of blessings. Seasons of refreshing are about to overtake you. Seasons of refreshing are about to overtake you. Are about to overtake you. Are about to overtake you. Would say the Lord. Would say the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 I have a prophetic word for you, Aaron. And for you, sister, Sarah, that which you have imagined within your mind, in your heart, that you have tried to figure out, should I do this or should I do that? And even at times you've been confused. Do not worry, would say the Lord, my hand is upon you. For even as I spoke to Joseph, even in a dream, and said, that which your wife has conceived is of the Holy Ghost, I'm about to confirm it to you, my son. I'm about to give you dreams. I'm about to give you revelation and understanding. And then you will say, this was not from Sarah, but this was from heaven. For you will hear from, for yourself the voice of your shepherd, and he will say to you, this is the way, walk ye in it. <laughs> ha. Woo. Ha. 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 My hand is upon you, my son. I have drawn you to this place. My spirit has quickened your heart. It's my conviction. And because you have surrendered and yielded, because you have said, yes, Lord, I'm going to walk the way of truth, I'm about to do some wonderful things. I'm about to bless you in ways that you could not imagine. And you will be overwhelmed with joy and peace. You'll be overwhelmed with love. You'll be overwhelmed. Then you'll begin to even cry and weep. And you're going to begin to say, I did not know it could be so good to live for God. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Listen, Brother Eric, the Lord would say, I'm bringing you out of the darkness. Woo for there's been a time of darkness where, to where you thought you couldn't even see the light. But yet the fire's been burning inside. 
the fire has not gone out. And I am failing the fire, and I'm going to cause it to once again burn bright. And ye, even that fire of heaven will rise up, and you'll burn like the bush that Moses saw on the side of Mount Sinai. And even people will turn aside out of curiosity, and they'll say, what is causing this bush to burn and not be consumed? It'll be the fire of heaven burning on the inside of you, would say the Lord. And so do not give up, do not quit, do not be discouraged. Decide in your heart right now, God, once again, I'm seeking your face like never before, and I'm going to press in and take a hold in Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm. Mm. For the Lord would say, I see the tenderness of your heart, the cry of your innermost being. For there's many things that have been tugging and pulling and trying to drag you aside. And yet there is within you, even like that, of the heart of like that, of a yearning and a longing inside. It sounds kind of strange, but I almost see like the desire that he put into the geese when it comes to the season where they need to fly south or north. And so God is pulling you into his will. And all you need to do is surrender to your heart and not your mind, your feelings, or your emotions. I see in the spirit people whispering in your ear and trying to draw you aside that they could devour you like a wolf with a little lamb. But the Lord would say to you, do not listen and hearken to those voices, but listen to me, for it's only in my arms you can be protected. For you see, I have a wonderful job for you. I have a wonderful purpose. And I have even created and formed and fashioned a man that will be after your heart's desire. And so do not yield to the lies. For if you step in that way, you'll discover nothing but torment and fear and anxiety. But step into the light of my glory and my love and my life will flow forth out of you like a mighty river. So my hand is upon you. Even to this time and at this moment, the enemy would have tried to devour, but I put a hedge around you, and I kept you, and I protected you. And so my hand is upon you, my daughter. Begin to cry out to me. Begin to seek me like never before. And it'll be like the sun rising up in the horizon, and the light of heaven and the glory of the Father will be upon you, and you will be blessed. For I pronounce a blessing on you. You're blessed coming in and you're blessed coming out. You're the head and not the tail. Hallelujah. 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 And Nancy, the Lord say, your prayers have prevailed. Your prayers have prevailed. And even though it may seem at times that I have not heard, I am working in the hearts. I am working in the lives of your loved ones, your children. And I'm about to do a mighty work. I've already done a mighty work, but I'm about to do an awesome thing. And you'll see it before in you'll see it with your own eyes before this next year is out. Huh. Huh. Mm. Daryl and Beverly, just one more thing the Lord told me to tell you. Your prayers have prevailed. Your prayers have prevailed. <laughs> Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout tonight. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah! Come on, let's stand to our feet and give the Lord a shout. Just do it by faith. Hallelujah! <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank him ahead of time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, Lord, we thank you. Ha! <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory. <laughs> pray for you, Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray for this young man. His father's a minister. His mother's a minister of the gospel. And I know being in the position he's in, it's so hard at times to walk 
in that realm because, because of his, his parents and them being in a ministry and, and all that happens in a ministry. But, Lord, I pray for my young brother that you would strengthen him and that you would speak to him. And, Lord, that you would give him a vision and give him a purpose. And, Lord, that he would not just see it's his mom and dad, but it's him. You're calling him. Your hand is upon him. you got a plan for him. you got a purpose for him. And you're doing awesome things in him, God. In him. And Lord, I thank you, Lord. Woo, by your spirit, let it be a fire that just burns in his bones, in his blood, in his marrow. Let it be a fire for the hunger of the things of the kingdom. Let his mind in his heart hunger for the reality of Jesus. Ha, Lord, we thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> just, just pray this me. Say, Heavenly Father, put a shout in my heart and in my mouth. The shouts of the King are in my life. And we thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Now, we are family. I want you to get this in your heart. See, don't worry whether or not the person next to you believe that you're family. They might not comprehend what we mean by this. We are family. See, blood is thicker than water, they say. You get it in your heart. We're family. You get it. We're family. We're there for each other. And I mean it. We are there for each other. Get it in your heart. Now, whether you, when you say that to somebody, whether they believe it or not, that's not the issue. You get it in your heart. You, you, you decide right now, I am there for you. And I want you to tell at least, well, tell everybody that I am there for you. I'm there for Go ahead, tell each other that I'm there for you. I'm there for you, Nancy. Amen. Go ahead, man. I'm there for you. Amen. Yes. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, I love, sister, sister Raquel, she has a ministry to the nursing homes and prisons. And if you want to get involved in going to nursing homes and prisons, see Sister Raquel. And ho and link up with Sister Raquel. If you want to go to prisons, ladies, and nursing homes, and man, Sister Raquel. And Sister Vi has been going for years, but right now God has us around a different place. But see Sister Raquel. Let me tell you something. Sister Raquel needs help. Sister Raquel needs help. God bless you. Hey, and there's, there's, uh, there's Sloppy Joe's over here. <laughs> and so let's fellowship. <laughs>